patients. Um, guys, why don't you pass those out? Um, we have uh, all of the, the notes that we're going to look at um, today that, and uh, the scripture verses. They are in version live. If you have a device that's connected to that, you can search for um, just if you hit live events, you'll see it right there. But this is the hard copy um, as well. And uh, we're continuing in our series uh, looking at all of the Selahs in the Psalms. The, the Selahs in the Psalms. And these are, uh, this is a musical term, and it's really very rich with meaning. Now, I, I just, quick show of hands, how many of you at some point in your life, you took some sort of music lessons, piano or some other instrument, okay? So quite a few of you. So, so you know that, you know, you'll see things when you're reading music, you'll see like an F there that, that means something to you. It means that you're gonna start playing this music forte. You're gonna start playing it a little bit louder. Or you'll see some signs that look kind of like greater than or less than signs that tell you that the music's getting louder, the music's getting softer. So we have those little notations in there. And this word sela is a musical notation like that. These, uh, most of these psalms, if not all of them, were written, written in musical format, um, that, that certainly poetic, that, that it flows and made it really easy to set to music. And we get several of the psalms that give us this sailor in here that tell us to pause. And so we're gonna look at that again today in Psalm 47. Now, this psalm um, carries with it at something that we learned last week. If you were here last week, I talked about how Hebrew poetry and a lot of Hebrew stories are different from what we think of in the Western world. Most of our stories, um, kind of builds, there, there's this struggle that's going on, there's this conflict, and it's building towards this moment where the hero comes on the scene, where everything resolves, and then you usually have a pretty uh, small, like, kind of letdown after that. Is that the whole story sort of resolves and wraps up, and you see that they all lived happily ever after, or whatever happened. In, in Hebrew poetry, and in a lot of Hebrew stories, the, the climax, or the most important part of the story, is usually right in the middle of the story. So you can understand if somebody was just verbally telling you a story, not one that was written down, you don't know exactly when the climax is coming. So it's really pretty good for keeping somebody on the edge of their seats, for keeping their attention, because you're like, I'm not exactly sure when we're going to get to the bang right there, and so I'm paying attention. And then once you get to that part, then you begin to realize, oh, I see how this other stuff built up. And, I, and so everything radiates out from that. So we saw this last week in uh, the, the Psalm 46 that we looked at last week, how that, that climax was right in the middle. And it's the same thing in Psalm 47. The middle verse, verse number five, this is, the, is the climax. This is the most important thing, and everything else radiates out from it, especially the first three words there, God has ascended. God has ascended. This is the most important part of the psalm. This is where everything radiates out from this thing that, that God has ascended. Now, this word ascended in the Hebrew can have three different meanings to it, and I want us to look at the definitions of this in, 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 a, in a way that's very helpful for us. Um, I want to remind you of a story. It was resurrection morning. It was the, the morning that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And there's reports flying around all over the place that Jesus is alive. Some of the disciples even went, you know, they got to the tomb and they looked inside and they're like, yep, he's, he's not here. And, and then there's some women that are saying, we saw Jesus. And there's some other people going, we don't know if we can believe them or not. And we look uh, in his history and his retelling of the story of Jesus, he tells about two disciples that, that later that day, they're walking along the road, heading towards a village called Emmaus, and just kind of shaking their heads. Like, just going, what is going on here? What, what, is, what is happening? I mean, the women said this, and some of our own disciples said this, and what, how do we wrap our heads around this? Because we know if somebody's dead, they're dead. But now they're saying that they're alive, and we don't get it. And they're so just kind of wrapped up in this, they don't even realize that a third traveler on the road is kind of joined alongside of them. They don't recognize him at first. It, it's Jesus. And Jesus asked them, what is so perplexing you? What, and they're, they said, what do you mean? Haven't you heard? This entire city has been turned upside down of what's going on. And we thought that Jesus was going to be the one, and yet he, he, they crucified him. But now somebody says he's alive, and we don't know what's going on. And Luke records this phrase. 
Jesus begins to speak to them and he explains to them how the entire scriptures, and Luke specifically mentions how the law, the Psalms, and the prophets, all of those things, how they all pointed to Jesus. Now, that's a great tool to remember. I know a lot of people, they start reading scriptures in what we now call the Old Testament, and they go, why is this here? This is, what am I supposed to do with this? You know what you do with it? You say, how does this show me Jesus? All of it is pointing to Jesus. So I want you to see these three definitions of this word, God has ascended. That word ascended. I want you to see these three definitions, but how specifically how these definitions point to Jesus. So one of the definitions of this word means to be exalted. Look what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore God exalted him, speaking of Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That word ascended means that he has been exalted. He is in a place to receive all praise. He has ascended the throne above all thrones. He has assumed the highest place above all places. But God has ascended. That second definition for that word ascended means to move to a higher place. Now, literally, this can mean if somebody climbed a ladder, that, that could be that word. They physically went to a higher place. But it also means somebody that went to a place of authority, but the implication being that somebody was trying to keep them down. Somebody was trying to keep them at this lower level, but they conquered and were able to go to a higher place. They were able to, to move to someplace different. Again, look what how this points to Jesus in Ephesians chapter 4. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, when he went up, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Now, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Jesus, when, when he died on the cross, then he could take from the devil the keys to hell and death and the grave. Those are his now. And then he ascends. Satan tried to keep him down, but he was exalted. He ascended beyond that. And the third definition for this word ascended, that God ascended, is to surpass expectations. To, to, to go beyond what you even, you know, sometimes you'll see people kind of go... Oh, it just blew my mind. I, I, that, was, that was so completely beyond what I ever expected to happen. That's what, what this means here, is that, that God ascended. He went so far beyond what anybody ever expected him to do. He went to a place that, that nobody expected him to go to. John gives us a glimpse of the, that he was shown in heaven. And at one point, John is, is crying because there is all of these scrolls and, and these documents that, that need to be opened and nobody can be found in all of heaven that, that is, can open these scrolls. And somebody comes over to John and says, hey, don't weep. Look at Jesus. He's the one that is worthy to open these seals. And so he surpassed these expectations. And so then here's what happens in heaven. We read in Revelation 5. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. So all three of these definitions of God ascending are all fulfilled in Jesus. He's exalted, he's moved to a higher place even though Satan tried to keep him down, and he has gone utterly, completely, totally beyond what any of our expectations were. Now, you might have noticed when I was reading some of those verses, I, I, I mentioned and I tried to highlight some of those things of every tribe and language and every people and every nation. That's because that appears all throughout this 47th Psalm. Look at verse number one, all the nations. Verse number two, all the earth. Verse number three, nations 
and peoples. Verse number 7, all the earth. Verse number 8, nations. Verse number 9, nations and people and kings of the earth. And in fact, in verse number 2, when it says, how awesome is the Lord Most High, that phrase, the Lord Most High, is Jehovah Elyon. Is, is the phrase that's used there. And literally, that, that means the Jehovah that is above all else, the God that surpasses expectations, the God that is, is on a plane that you can't even imagine. It's not that he's number one in certain categories. It means that he's the only one that fits the bill for that category. There's, there is no second, third, fourth place. He fills the entire list. It's all him when he is called the Lord Most High. In fact, Throughout the Old Testament, when you have the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence, in Hebrew, the full name for that is the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah of Hosts. It's a reminder that God wasn't the God just of Israel. He wasn't excluded to just that one little strip of land. He is the God of all nations, all people, all language, all tribes, all ethnicities, no matter where they are, all people have one God, and he stands alone. And so in this psalm, like I said, we've got this, God has ascended is the most important thing, that God is on this throne. But notice that just before that is where the Selah is. Now, now look what's happening. And, and you can kind of imagine it, um, that, that people are clapping their hands. Um, th think about a, a people that they've been held in bondage. They, they've been under, they've been oppressed by a, a ruling kingdom that has been evil and wicked and has kept them down and has, has, has just oppressed the people where they can't live their lives in, in any kind of freedom. And there's another monarch that now has come in. He is a rightful king, but maybe the people don't really see him yet as their king, but they certainly see him as the conqueror. Because he's come in and overthrown the king that was holding them down. And so you can see them as they, they kind of like are standing along the streets. And, and they hear some noise and they look down the street. And they realize, here, here comes that. Here he comes. Okay. They, they begin to clap. And it says that they begin to shout with joy. And they say, oh, how awesome is this guy? And then they, they, they start expressing their gratitude and their thanks. They say, we're, we're grateful. You know, you can see, as he, maybe as his carriage is coming by, his train is coming by, that they're like, oh, thank you. Thank you for, for overthrowing these. And thank you for adopting us as your people, for taking us on and giving us this freedom. Thank you for that. Oh, man, this is, this is amazing. So, so you can kind of hear that in these first four verses. They're, they're kind of building uh, towards that. But then there's this pause. There's this sela there. Now, I've shared with you before that Selah can mean uh, one of three different definitions. This one is definitely that pause for everybody to take a breath so that it can crescendo, so that it can explode in praise as, as they, you see this king, not only you're clapping and you're excited and you're saying, oh man, awesome job. Thanks for setting us free. Thanks for taking us on as your people. Thanks for giving us that freedom. But now the king is walking up the steps, heading towards the throne, and he's finally coronated. He's finally crowned as the king over these people. And, and as he ascends the throne, as he sits in his royal throne, and the crown is placed on his head, now people will say, well, now he's on the throne. God has ascended. And all of a sudden, there's this explosion of praise. It would be very similar in, in our setting uh, and earth, you've, you've heard it before. People going, long live the king! Long live the king! You're, you're, you're expressing your gratitude. We're, we're glad that this king has assumed his place on the throne. And so there's this pause for this explosion of praise, this crescendo of praise to begin after that. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. Now, I read for you earlier in Revelation what was happening there. But let me Take it a little bit further. Let me read those verses from Revelation 5 again. But I want you to hear the shout, the explosion of praise. 
they're singing this song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. And then John speaking. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. In other words, he can't count them all. As far as he looks, he just sees people, every tribe, nation, tongue, group, everywhere that he looks, he just sees people. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they sang, they break into a new song. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Can I get the idea? You can keep putting and, 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 and in there. I mean, he's running out of words. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's exactly what the sons of Korah are capturing here in this 47th Psalm. They are getting a glimpse of the throne room of heaven as well. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. This word is not just shouting. It doesn't just mean I made my voice louder. It means that the shout of joy means a shout of acclamation. I affirm, I acknowledge, I totally, I'm in total agreement that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are worthy to be on that throne. You're worthy to receive all this power, glory, honor, praise, dominion, everything that we can give you. You're worthy of all of that. And then it says the Lord is ascending amid the sounding of trumpets. That is such a weak word. It's the thundering of trumpets. The trumpets have blown so loud that this thunder peal rips through the heavens. And then the singing starts. Verse number six, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. In, in uh, Hebrew, this, this verse is actually only six words long. The, the word zamar is the word for sing. And so this word in Hebrew says, Zamar Elohim, that's God. Zamar Elohim, Zamar. Zamar Melach, that means king, Zamar. That's it. This just says, sing to, the, to God, sing to the king, sing a little bit more, and then sing some more after that. Just keep singing to the king, singing to the exalted one. In fact, that word sing, there five times in just those two verses, of verses six and seven. They're singing, they're singing, they're singing. They're shouting. They're singing thunderous praise that's taking place because God has ascended his throne. That's what the focal point is. But here's this pause, and I still, I find it a little bit odd. I, I mean, I get it musically, how to, to make a, a, uh, a musical statement, you know, how the music is kind of building, and then there's this pause for the choir and all the people playing instruments to take a big breath so that, that way they can just boom and there can be thundering praise as you come out. I get it, but I almost think it wasn't that a little bit of a momentum killer? Like we're, we're already, we're clapping, we're already shouting, we're already saying, awesome God, thank you for doing this. So why, why pause there? Why keep on? I think the reason why there's the pause there is because I think that a lot of us are just too quiet in our praise. And this is a pause to say, do you realize what's happening here? Can you take it up a notch or two, or three or four or five or six? I think the reason why we are sometimes too quiet in our prayer, in our praise, is because we haven't gotten a clear enough look at who it is that we're praising. When you gaze at the majestic awesomeness of God, and that so fills you, there's an explosion of praise that should naturally come forth as a result of that. If you go, yeah, you know, it's, it's okay. You haven't really looked. You haven't, you haven't really looked at what's going on. I like in the Psalms, there's several different words that are used in the Psalms. Two of them are used in, in this Psalm 47 that we're looking at. But in order to express praise, the, there has to be like all of the, these multiple Hebrew words to, to let us know. So let me just kind of move across here. Halal is where we get the word hallelujah. And that just means that we celebrate God with a shout. Hallelujah. Okay, that's that word. Halal. 
We're, we're saying praise to God. Hallelujah is praise to God. Hallel yada means that we praise him with thankfulness with outstretched arms like this. Oh, it's almost like you say, God, you've given me all of this, all of these blessings. Yada, I praise you for these things. But then I like this. Tauda means that you thank God with your arms like this, specifically for answers that you haven't received yet. God, I have all this, but I'm grateful for what you're still going to give me. And it's pour it in. I'm ready for it. And I'm thanking you in advance for what you're going to get. That's tada. Shabbat means to, again, to shout to God. And you can see the little, the little graphic there. It's starting to get a little bit more excited. It's starting to move around a little bit more. It's not just shouting again by raising your voice. You're kind of getting your whole body into this. Barach means to bless God. A lot of times this word shows up when God shows up and people fall flat on their face in God's presence. Because believe me, they got a really good look at his holiness. And their legs just went to jelly and they fell flat. John talks about that in the book of Revelation. That when he turned around. Now, remember, Jesus is the guy that he was so close to that at the Last Supper, he's leaning up next to him. You would think that he's fairly familiar with Jesus. And yet, in the book of Revelation, when he hears a voice behind him and he turns around and he sees Jesus now glorified, the King of Kings, wearing his crown, he, his knees just buckle and he falls to the ground in the presence of this awesome God. Zamar, we already talked about that word. That's the word, word to sing. But I love this kind of catch-all word. You can see all of these things in here. This tahala. Um, the, the best way that I can think to describe it is, is, a, is a kid on Christmas morning. Can, can, we, can, we, can, we, can we do it now? They, they can't contain themselves, right? Or sometimes you'll see it on the sports field. Right? There's a crucial play, and the players are watching, they're watching, and then they're just like, and, and they're jumping in each other's arms, and they're tackling each other. Some people, they, they're just running laps around the field. They don't even know what they're doing. You know, that's, that's really kind of what this tahala means. It's just like, I can't even hold it in. I can't contain it. Now, we see a lot of this in the story when, remember we talked about earlier, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah of hosts, all people. It had been gone from Jerusalem for a while, and it is now being returned to Jerusalem. And David is thrilled. The, the, the words there are a lot like this. He's dancing around. It says he danced before the Lord with all his might. He is shouting his halals, I'm sure and singing and twirling. He can't even contain himself. He is so excited. And then we see a picture of his wife looking down, mortified. David comes home later that day, walks in the house, and he is still just brimming with joy. He's still just kind of, there's a bounce in his step. He comes in. And you talk about getting cold water thrown on you. She's like, with her voice dripping with sarcasm, oh, boy, what a spectacle you made today. Man, did you embarrass yourself? You embarrassed your whole family? That's not how you behave. You were so undignified. And David said, you know what? If worshiping God makes me undignified, I can't wait to get more undignified. You know what he's really saying? is I'm so enraptured with God, I'm so focused on this King of Kings, I really can't even hear what anybody else is saying around me, and nor do I care what anybody else around me says. Right? You know, there, there's a, if some of the songs that, that we sing sometimes, there's one song that we sing called I Could Sing of Your Love Forever, and part of that song says, oh, I feel like dancing, it's foolishness I know, but when the world has seen the light, when the world has seen this king the way that I've seen him, they'll be dancing with joy like I'm dancing with joy. It's, it becomes, people are like, how can you be that excited about it? What, what, what are you so excited about? And I got news for you. If, if you struggle with this, like, oh man, I don't know if I feel really comfortable with shouting. I, I don't know if I really feel very comfortable with these thundering trumpets. That, that just seems, I don't know, it's a little bit too undignified. Well, guess what? When Jesus comes back, he's going to be highly undignified then because it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout 
and with the voice of an archangel and with the blasting trumpets of God. Don't be like David's wife, Michael, and go, oh, that is so undignified. I, I can't believe you're embarrassing yourself acting like that. But if you begin to just worship God now, the way this psalm invites us to, the way this psalm just takes all of the focus and puts it on the king of kings that has ascended the throne, that's been exalted, that's overcome, that's surpassed all expectation, if you're getting such a close look at him that you're shouting, you're dancing around a little bit, who cares what anybody else says? Because you know what? When they see that it's the real deal, when they when they see that, that it's you're not just putting on an act, but you're just really so enraptured with the king. Just like that song says, they're going to see that joy. And, then, and Peter tells those people are going to ask him, okay, can you tell me the reason for the hope that you have? Can you tell me why you're so happy? He, what is it that you're looking at? You, what, what, are, what are you gazing on that is, is so just over, and you, and you don't mind being undignified? As it, get a good look at our king. So that you don't care. If you shout hallelujah and people are going, what's going on with you? I'm just praising my king because he's worthy to receive all of the praise that we can give him. So let me give you just four quick thoughts to wrap this up. First of all, God is the king of kings. Like I said earlier, he's not like number one on a list of other gods or other deities. He's on a list all by himself. Nobody compares to him. There, there's, there's nothing that, that you, you can say, well, he just barely edges out here. Or let's, let's put the two side by side and see which one kind of comes out. In a, he, he's already the conquering king. That We already see that picture not only here in the Psalms. God has ascended the throne above everybody else. But we see it in the very last book of the Bible as well. You alone are the one that's worthy to receive all praise and glory and honor and power and dominion over all the nations. So God is the king of kings. So don't, don't get, well, you know, do I please these people or do I, do I please God? Do, do, just focus on him. And who cares what, what people have to say about it? The second lesson is God gets the best. God gets the best. In this Psalm, verse number 7, it says, I'm reading out of the NIV version, it says, sing to him a psalm of praise. Some translations have another English word in there which comes a little bit more close to the definition. It's sing to him a psalm of understanding. The idea is that you are, because you are seeing God a little bit more clearly, you are understanding a little bit more who God is and how much praise that your song is starting to get better. You should be able to praise God better today than you praised him last week because you saw him more clearly this week. Every day that goes on, your praise should get richer and deeper and, dare I say, louder um, because you are more focused on him and you care less and less about the people around you. So God gets the very best. Now, thirdly, God deserves a holy vocabulary. Now, there's a word that appears here, and I just want to use this one word as an example, and I've used it a couple of times this morning. It says, how awesome is God? That word, awesome, any time in the scripture that it's used, it's only people talking to God or people talking about God. It's not used anywhere else. Awesome. It means I stand in awe. You Create this awe in me. When I think about you, I am in utter awe. Now, I, I want, listen, I, I, I'm not, I don't say this, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to, you know, make you feel guilty about anything. But just, I want you to just think about this for a minute, for a second. If you're standing somewhere giving God praise and you're telling him how awesome he is, is it really appropriate to then talk about how awesome your hamburger is? If you see an athlete on the field that makes a catch, is it really an awesome catch? If you're giving, if you're telling God that he's awesome? When we talk about holy, we mean things that are set apart for a special purpose that they're not used anywhere else. 
And if you begin to ask the Holy Spirit, what can I give to God? Maybe even in my vocabulary, maybe in my actions. What, what am I going to give to him that I don't give to anybody else? God deserves a holy vocabulary. He deserves holy actions from us. Things that we give him that we don't ascribe to anybody else. In other words, we don't even allow the same feelings of majestic awe and wonder to, to come up anywhere else, except if maybe you're standing there looking at that sunset or that mountain range, and you go, oh, this is an awesome God that created this. You know, and you begin to sing that song, oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds your hands have made. Then sings my soul, how great you are, how great thou art. And my, my praise comes back then. But keep the vocabulary, keep the actions holy for God. And finally, notice this, we highlighted this several times. God is God over all nations, all people, all languages. We read it in Philippians that at the end of time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the King. Every knee. They are either going to bow in humble, holy, grateful adoration, or they're going to bow in abject terror of an all-righteous judge. So let's stay on mission. The reason why we give God the praise, the reason why our focus goes on Him, is because we want other people to look to Him as well. Our praise can become missionary. When we start telling, we're just by our praise, we're telling other people, there's something so beyond what I think about, what you think about me. There's something so beyond that and so worthy of praise that other people are going to go, I don't have anything like that in my life. I would like to have that as well. I'd like to focus on that as well. So let's make sure that our lives are bringing more people to the knowledge that Jesus is the King. And we're going to do a lot of that by the way that we praise. He's worthy to be praised. This psalm tells us that God is clap worthy. He is praise worthy. He is dance worthy. He is shout worthy. He is trumpet blasting worthy. Okay? So don't hold back in what we give him. He is the God who has ascended the throne. Let's give him all the praise. Look at this psalm one more time. Let's read.